and enjoy our time together. Last night when we got home, we had a very, very nice surprise. Uh, my daughters phoned, well, the older one phoned mom and said, you know, we would love to, uh, to sing for you for your birthday, but the younger sister was still sleeping or has been sleeping since early in the morning or early in the uh, evening rather. And uh, she uh, needed to just go and wake her up. And we said, don't wake her up, that's fine. And they asked, when are you home so we can do this then? And we said, we just pulled in. And uh, she said, no, wait, I'm going to, uh, to wake Monique. And we heard some talking about waking and, hello, hello, come on, there you are. And then we walked into the front door just as they started singing over the phone, but all of a sudden, it didn't come over the phone, it came from the steps in the house. <laughs> So they were there, and, uh, uh, you know, when they come and visit, we like to uh, remind them that they grew up in a house where they were busy, busy, busy with uh, all kinds of stuff. So um, we're going to make them busy again this morning. Come lead our song service for us, please. It was a good surprise nonetheless. I really like doing that. <laughs> um, we're going to sing one of my personal favorites. It's called Springs of Living Water. And if you would all help us sing nice and loud. <laughs> I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, a wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God, it makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I trod, I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, a wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsty spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, a wonderful and bountiful supply. Now, she came for the new song, right? I just came to hear how your practicing has been going. So can you guys all please stand as we sing Victory in Jesus?
That sounds good. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing our song service this morning. Now, last night when I went to bed, uh, I uh, actually went to bed with a younger wife. <laughs> this morning when I woke up, she was a year older. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ella. We are so glad that uh, you are with us and that you have been willing to, you know, grow old with a grumpy old guy <laughs> and uh, appreciate that. And we do hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful new year. <laughs> and not only is uh, this weekend Ella's birthday, it's also Mother's Day. Uh, so thank you very much, Ella, for three wonderful kids, especially two daughters that could come and visit with us this weekend, and to every other mother in our uh, assembly this morning. We're so glad that you have mothered your children and have been gracious, uh, tenacious, and that you are still around helping them on. I wonder who's our oldest mother here today. It might be, might be you. How long have you been a mother? I told you I'm not going to do the math. I had kids when I was 19. I'm now 81. Okay, it's a few years. <laughs> you, you actually could have just thought about a uh, Christie's age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any anybody here qualifies for being the youngest mother? Yeah. You would have been the youngest dad, I would think. No way. The, a younger mother is most probably in the Yeah, okay, there you are. Now, to each mother year, we have, uh, as a token of our appreciation, a little potted plant. And they are around the corner. When we leave this morning, please pick up one of those potted plants as a thank you to each one of you for being a faithful mother. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, you have you have the green light and you know how and for whom you can pick up a plan. Thank you mothers for being here. Ella, sing us a song. Savior came from heaven to earth he died on a cross of shame have you ever sought to know why he paid the price why he did to Calvary go as the sinner's sacrifice Never in a million years If that could be Could we know the reason why he suffered on the cross For you and me Willingly 
die that day. Die to take our sin away. But never in a million years could we understand his love. No, we cannot comprehend why Jesus cared. Why he became our friend and our sorrow shared. Oh, the secrets will remain with God above. But we now can praise his name for the wonder of his love. Never in a million years, if that could be, could we know the reason why he suffered on the cross for you and me? Willingly died that day, died to take our sin away. But never in a million years could we understand such love. Never in a million years would we understand such love. So let's ask. It's a short time span, but we had some time to, uh, I hope, look at our quiz for last night when we spoke about water and blood, which equals baptism through water when the blood of Jesus covers us. So uh, <clears throat> let's see how you did with your quiz. In the last commission Jesus gave his disciples, he used the word all quite a few times. Could you name them? I give you nobody Okay, you've got to take out your Bible then and turn to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Matthew 28, that's the last chapter of the book of Matthew and basically the last two verses. Hmm? No, you're right. I was just trying to uh, <coughs> uh, jog your minds or memories here, but it didn't help, so we will have to read it. So it begins with all what? Authority. Authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all, all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. So how many times did we got them there? Four times. And uh, it's fairly comprehensive. God means business with the exclamation of the good news and the invitation to everybody to accept it. How many times 
is the concept of baptism used in the New Testament. At least, mm, who was doing that tentative number there? <laughs> 80, yes, confirmed. <laughs> At least 80 times. I think I actually uh, prompted you that that might be a quiz question, didn't I? Ah. What does the Greek word baptismo means in its original form? And by what linguistic format did it land as baptized in the English translation? Submerge. Submerge or immerse or put it under. Submerge. Good. And how did it become Baptized in our New Testament. And transliterated. transliterated. Yes. Good for you. What are the prerequisites of baptism? What do we need to do before we get baptized? Um, understand what it means. Yes. So we need to be taught. Yes, then, yes, yes, we need to accept Jesus as the one inviting us. And then the last thing is to, ah, that makes it four actually, hey, eh? because repent is, is a part of it. And we also need to, Believe. It's believe, uh, learn, repent, and be baptized. Okay. Uh, of what is baptism the Christian symbol? Yes. It's not a day, but a action that commemorates the fact that Jesus was buried and resurrected. So baptism is a symbol of that instead of a day that the old dragon wants us to believe is a commemoration of the resurrection. Baptism is that. Did you, go, did you do okay with these? Remember, if you fill them out and you return them, at the end, we have a book for you. Uh, don't forget about that and make sure you get all those quizzes in. Then, if you have been here last night and will be here tonight and tomorrow night, we also have a book for you for attending these three weekend nights, a book called The Ministry of Healing, and we would love for you to get this book, uh, sharing with us some pointers on how to live a good life. So without further ado, I don't think I have anything to, uh, to share with you anymore. Let's get into this morning's topic. Oh, my goodness, yes. Thank you so much. What would I do without Ryan? <laughs> he, he keeps me wired. He keeps me uh, wireless. Uh, I just love it. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, as we think about how the devil goes about trying to become our master so that we would serve him, we pray that you will again show us how we can be more than victorious through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on our behalf, calling us into a relationship with him. Bless us as we open your word today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I read the book of Revelation, there is one word 
that comes to mind. The word victory. We all want to be victorious, don't we? Especially in our Christian experience. We want to be overcomers. However, most people today are living under a cloud haunted by fear and failure. Have you found yourself there too? It's such a pity because God's Word clearly reveals some laws in life that can give anyone a life of victory and success. And this morning, I'm going to share three of those laws with you. And I'm going to test and see whether I am at least halfway a decent lecturer by giving you a quiz just as uh, soon as I have done those three laws. So please help me out by listening carefully and doing well on the quiz. Some people make Christian living a very complicated thing. Some goes to opposite, opposite extremes and making Christian life a meaningless simplicity. But I believe that the testimony of a little old lady in a prayer meeting was right on point, even though the language wasn't as polished as one would like it to be. She said, well, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I'm going to be. But anyhow, praise God, I ain't what I was. This old Christian lady, I think, understood the three essentials of victorious spiritual experiences in the life of a Christian. She recognized that her life wasn't all that it ought to be. And she had a determination to take further steps by the grace of God to do something about it. And there was a gratitude in her life for what he already have done in her life. She had confident assurance that Jesus was actually working in her life. So many people today are just the opposite. They are frustrated and bewildered because they can't seem or can't see any way to reach the high standard which God's Word is revealing to us. Here is what God really wants each one of us to be. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I write this to you that you will not sin. We are admonished to go on to perfection and also to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Those are the high goals that we can reach through Jesus Christ and totally go beyond mortal imagination. Peter stated it this way, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Though these He has given us, uh, though, uh, sorry, uh, no, once again, through, thank you for reading with me, through these He has given us His very great and pr precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world 
caused by evil desires. Would you like to have a participation in God's divine nature? We can, apparently. And maybe the next question that comes up in our minds is, how can we reach these high ideals when we already have trouble reaching the goals we now have for ourselves in our lives? The Apostle Paul shows us the way to victory. And maybe you will understand, after we're done with this presentation, why we sing the, the song as our theme song every night, Victory in Jesus. Because this is what it is all about, living victoriously in and through Jesus Christ. In chapter 7 of Romans, Paul comes and gives us a vivid description of his own struggle with the very same problem. And then in the next chapter, he comes and shares with us some solutions to what we are struggling with and not being victorious in Christ. The key to victorious living involves, as I said, three laws. Three laws of Christian experience. The first law is God's Ten Commandment law, which points out sin in our lives. I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said do not covet. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. So when the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So what does God say about, what does Paul say about God's commandments? It's holy and good and righteous and it's worth recognizing in our lives. So are we sure this is the Ten Commandments that Paul is talking about? He is quoting the Tenth of the Ten Commandments. So we know that he's speaking about the Ten Commandments and he says it's holy and righteous and good and shows us our need of a Savior because it shows us that we have committed sin. Paul wants to keep the law, but is it easy? Unfortunately, not. So there is a second law that he says plays into the life of a person. And this is what he says about that law. We know that the law is spiritual. This is the Ten Commandments. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. So what does he call the second law that plays into the life of a human being? The law of sin and what? Death. The law of sin 
and death. Paul says he wants to do what the law of God tells him to do, but he is always falling short of his goal. Have you experienced the same thing in your life? I want to, but when I find myself, I have already done the opposite of what I wanted to do. And maybe Paul's predicament and ours is well expressed by the little girl whose mother caught her with her hand in the cookie jar. And she told her, don't do that. And just a little while later, guess what? Mother found her with her hand in the cookie jar again. And she says, Mary, why do you do it? And tearfully, the little girl replied, Mama, I don't know. I don't always want to do what I want to do. And this is us. I don't like what I'm doing, but before I know, I've already done it. This isn't too far from Paul's description of our predicament, of our problem, is it not? He goes on and he says, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in my member or in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that work within my members. You recognize that? The law of sin prevents us from obeying the law of God. And finally, when he evaluates everything that is in front of him, he calls out, What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. And I'm so thankful that Paul didn't end his letter to the Romans right there. He doesn't leave us just with the problem. No! This is not the last word. He comes and introduces us to yet another third law. And the third law he calls the law of the spirit of life. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life sets me free free from the law of sin and death in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. In other words, Paul says that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus the third law, has power to overcome the law of sin in us, the second law, and makes it possible for us to keep God's Ten Commandments, the first law. Do you get that? Now, what does the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from. 
Does it set us free from the Ten Commandment law? No. Life in Christ doesn't make void God's holy law. But it does free us from the old life of habitual sinning. Of this we can be certain because of the result Paul describes of the successful operation of the th third law, the law of sp uh, spirit, uh, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. I want you to notice again when he talks in verse four. In order that the righteous requirements of the law, the first law, God's Ten Commandments, might be fully met in us. Is it abandoned? No, it is brought to fulfillment in us. This is the only way it can and should be. No one can keep God's law unless he is in Christ Jesus. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus comes and sets us free from the old natural life of defeat and failure. I don't mean to imply that when the third law goes into operation in our lives, we become perfect overnight. No, because the Christian life is a growing experience. But with Paul, I do want to testify of a power that has set me free from the law of sin and death, and it can do the same for each one of us. One of the things that I used to enjoy as a young boy was to sit and watch when we had our yearly vacations at the seaside, how the seagulls flew over the waves. They could just soar through the air, barely moving a feather, it seemed like. And I always wanted to do that too. Have you ever wished that you could fly? Oh, man. But the problem was, no matter how I flapped my arms, I could have flapped them until they fell off. I just couldn't get off the ground because of a law that we call the law of gravity. Gravity was preventing me from doing what I really wanted deep down in my heart. However, there is another law, the law of aerodynamics that enables me to overcome the law of gravity and when that law kicks in, I can fly. It's called Bernoulli's law and it states, as air moves across a surface, it reduces the pressure exerted on that surface. Airplane wings are designed so that the air that goes over the top of the wing moves over a curved surface, and as a result, it moves faster than the air that goes underneath the wing. The faster the wing moves through the air, the greater the pressure differential becomes until finally it reaches a point, you can ask Steve about that, until finally it reaches a point where the air pressure 
under the wing is so much greater than the pressure on top that it actually lifts the plane. I remember so well when I was supposed to take my first flight. I was in the army and needed to go to a battleground area. And we were all standing there waiting for the big bird to pick us up. And I looked at this thing and I thought to myself, just because I'm going to be inside it, it's not going to lift. <laughs> and when I got in, I closed my eyes and prayed a lot. Lord, please let this thing fly. I know there's a rule that says it should, but I also know my luck. And I was thinking about my girlfriend that I was leaving behind and a few other things that went through my mind. I remember hearing us slowly taxiing to the end or maybe the beginning of the runway. And I heard this airplane revving up. And the, the sounds were <laughs> atrocious. And then it felt like the pilot released the handbrake. And there we were going, faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden, we were in the air flying to where we needed to go. I was so sure that the law of gravity was going to keep me grounded. But fortunately, there was a second law, the law of aerodynamics, and it released me and helped me fly away in the same way. The law of the spirit of life overcomes the law of sin and death, which would drag us downward and enables us to hit the ground with our nose. But the moment that the law of the Spirit plays into our lives, we soar into obedience to God's law. So how do we put this third law to work for us? Now, just before we get into that, maybe time for the quiz. We talk about three laws. What is the th first law? The law of God, which gives us the Ten Commandments to live by. The second law is called the law of sin and death. Oh, there's script notes, I see. <laughs> and then the third law comes into play, and that is called the law of spirit and life. Well, I'm not doing too bad. Good for you. So how do we get this third law to work for us? There are two steps involved in making the third law work. There is a part that we need to do, and there is a part that God will do for us. What is our part in this whole situation? Romans 8 verse 5 comes and says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And I think, we can say, there we have it. This is where the battle for the mind 
comes into play. The Bible tells us that we must set our minds on the Spirit if we want to live a victorious life. life. I think we could even call it, we need some mental discipline. Mental discipline is not to be confused with what Norman Vincent Peale made popular, talking about the power of positive thinking, or what Maxwell Maltz in his Psycho-Cybernetics made available, or Napoleon Hill when he says, think and grow rich. Not what we're talking about. There are three key texts that would explain how to put the law of the Spirit to work for us through mental discipline. The first text comes from Proverbs, where it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In a large way, then, we see that the Bible says that your thoughts determine who you are. And all depending on what you think, it will influence the way you live. Jesus said, the good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Meaning that our thoughts not only determine who we are, they control what we do. And then Paul comes and he says in Romans 12, 2, be transformed by what? The renewing of your minds. So in other words, if our thoughts determine who we are and they control what we do in order to have changed behavior, we simply, according to Paul, needs to have a change of mind. Our first responsibility as Christians is to turn the direction of our thoughts to spiritual things, to the ways of God. It's absolutely impossible to do the right while we are thinking about the evil. You cannot take a picture of a pile of garbage and expect it to come out looking like a beautiful rose. Mental discipline, exposing your mind to that which is right, is the way to develop a winning life. It seems simple, I know, but we also know to change your thoughts can be quite a challenge so that you can change your behavior. But in practice, it's not that easy. Or am I the only one that have discovered that? Why is it not easy? Because We think in patterns, and those patterns are called habits. And the moment that we use the word habit, yep, our ears go up, our eyes go wide, and we think to ourselves, habits are bad things. Habits could be bad, but actually habits are fairly good things. Can you remember when you first started 
tying your shoelaces. Oh my goodness, that was a huge thing. You needed to remember that what's left needs to go right, what's right needs to go left, and then uh, you need to get them and then make a little loop and then another loop and it was a big thing. You had to specifically sit down and think about how you tie your shoelaces. Any of you still wear shoes with laces? How long does it take you to, uh, to tie your shoelaces nowadays? You can do it without even thinking about it. I can tie my tie nowadays that way. Who of you remember when you first tried driving a stick ship car? <laughs> Did it go well? Because there were so many things that you had to remember. You know, there was the gas pedal, there was the brake pedal, there was the clutch pedal, and to, uh, to get away you had to be in first gear and the release of and pressure on the different pedals and wow it wasn't easy and then you you hopped around a little didn't you any of you still drive shift cars nowadays i have my first automatic car that I ever drove right now. All the other ones. <laughs> yeah, well, can you remember the first time that you had to stop at a uphill red light? And there was somebody behind you and you needed to pull away? Not an easy process, but doing it over and over and over again, you have formed a habit. And if I ask you, can you remember the last time that you stopped uphill with somebody behind you and stalled the car? Can't remember because it is a habit that formed and is no longer a problem. A simple explanation then of how the brain works and helps us understand ourselves better. Yeah, sure, there are bad habits, but mostly habits are good things that helps us navigate life in such a way that we don't have to think about little things majorly all the time. The human brain has two halves, a right side and a left side. The left side is like a general in the army. He has the power and the authority to analyze situations and then issue orders to be carried out so that the actions would be the best he can come up with. The right side is more like the troops. They have the power to execute orders, but they don't make them. The general is basically powerless to execute the orders and the troops do not have the power or the authority to give the orders. If they're a good army, they simply obey indiscriminately the orders that they are given. The left brain analyzes situations, makes decisions based on what is right or wrong 
or expedient, but it doesn't have the power to carry out those decisions it makes. The right brain obeys the orders that the left brain gives without analyzing whether it's right or wrong, whether it's the best or not. The next thing important to understand is that most of the time the left brain gives the orders to the right brain in the form of mental images or pictures. For example, if I would say the word car, you probably see an image of a car in your mind. If you would mention the word car to me, I would immediately see a VW Black Passat. You might see a different car in your mind, but you don't see the letters C, A, R, most probably not. And these images are orders to the right brain and they will uh, obey the right brain. For example, when a student sees himself as a failure, the brain gives instructions to the left brain, to the right brain, to do things that will cause him to fail. Unfortunately so. A student who maintains an image of himself as successful is giving instructions from the left to the right brain to do things that will cause him to be successful. So you can see how important it is for parents to be very careful about the things that they say to their children. Things like, ah, you're so bad, you're really not going to mount to anything ever in your life, are the kinds of things that cause destructive self-images and eventually to failure. So I want you to have an exercise in what I have just told you. I want you to see this nice juicy lemon that I have in my hand. It's fresh. The skin is vibrant. It's, oh, maybe it would be nice if we cut this lemon. So let me get my knife out of my pocket. It's a, it's a little dull, but I want you to focus on how I am cutting this lemon at the moment. Oh, the knife being so dull is not cutting through the skin well, but eventually, oh, there it is. It is now running juice all over my hand, down my arm. But it is in two halves now. And I'm going to have a little uh, sip of the one half. Oh, ooh, it's nice. It is so nice, dripping on my tongue. And oh, I'm asking you, is any of you having a, a mouth that is a little wetter than you know, did your mouth salivate? Have you seen a lemon? Have you tasted a lemon? Have you done anything than just imagine a lemon? So what is happening here? We have stored pictures in our mind. And our left brain said, lemon, oh, wait, 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 wait. When you have a lemon and you cut it with a dull knife, it's going to produce juice. 
and that juice is going to be tart, sour, and hey, right ba brain, this is how you need to react. Make a lot of saliva in the mouth of the person or in your owner because it's your mind. And that is how it happens. I remember sharing this story with a group where there was a man that had no hair on his head. He was as bald as Terry Savalas. And when we were drinking the drops from the lemon, he started sweating all over his bald head because he couldn't take the taste. But he didn't taste anything. It was just a reaction from the mind. Left brain that said, right brain, this is how you need to react. And what did the right brain do? Didn't, didn't evaluate, didn't do anything, just did what it was told. So when people usually come and tell me that they have difficulty in growing spiritually, one of the first things I would ask is, so what do you fill your mind with? The entire world is set up to send the wrong images to you and thus control your behavior. There is a computer term that is used quite extensively. It's called GIGO. You remember what GIGO means? Garbage in, garbage out. You can't put anything out that is different to what you have put into your lives, into your minds. You cannot fill your mind with thoughts from the cesspools of this world and expect to soar in obedience to God. The Bible comes and says, fix your mind on the things of the Spirit, and those things you will do. The images we maintain in our mind are like a goal or a target which our brain will guide us towards. This is the secret of a victorious life. If you want to see the third law in life work in your mind, discipline your mind. Think about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. If we don't, we will not gain anything good in our own lives. Paul says that this discipline must be total. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. A person who is dead does not respond. Many who profess the name of Christ are just spiritual necrophiliacs. What big word is that? 
I had to look it up to find this. It's people who still love the old life of sin that is supposed to be buried in the waters of baptism. And it is altogether too easy to dig them up and lovingly pursue it again. Paul says we are to be dead to sin, not even to let our minds dwell on it anymore. And then he says we are to live or to be alive to Christ Jesus. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Some are concerned when bad thoughts seem to just pop up in, your he in their heads. But let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with a bad thought coming into your head. We call that a temptation. And a temptation is not sin. It becomes wrong when you choose to keep it there and to dwell on it. Like the ancient proverb, and oft I heard, repeated by Martin Luther, you cannot prevent a bird from flying over your head or even landing in your hair, but you can certainly prevent it from making a nest there. We need to learn to recognize those wrong thoughts as soon as they enter our minds and then replace them with good spiritual thoughts. The quicker we do that, easier the battle will be and the sooner we will gain the victory. That is the real battle for the mind. I learned a secret from a banana tree when we lived in a town called Nelspreet back in South Africa. This was long, long ago. And now spread was called the bread basin of the country. We had this banana tree in our backyard. Now, banana trees, I don't know whether you know, produces one bunch of bananas. And then they die. Each tree, though, sends up little shoots all around them and will grow to become banana trees fairly quickly. And if you let them go, the banana trees will come, become so thick that they will choke each other and die. So you have to keep cutting down the trees to thin them out to keep a banana tree uh, producing. So I chopped the trees down uh, with my, or the one that I had with my machete, but there were others, and I dragged it to the back of the yard. It was hard work. And there were two or three more banana trees that already had their crop uh, produced. So by the end of the day, I was almost totally exhausted, but there were still some banana trees that needed cut down. And that's when I saw these tiny little sprouts uh, shooting up around the other old banana trees, and it dawned on me to just whack down those shoots. I did, put them in my pocket, and when my pockets were full, I simply walked over to the back of the lot and emptied my pockets. That's the secret. Learn to recognize those thoughts as soon as they come into your mind. Whack them off while they are little. 
replace them with good thoughts, and you can be victorious. Suppose someone comes to our meetings, and they learn that their bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 does say that. And he recognizes that he has a few habits that are defiling his body, maybe like smoking or using uh, chemical substances or whatever. And he realizes that those does not belong in one's body. So after making a decision about that, we had a man <laughs> that, uh, that, that decided that he was going to stop smoking. He was a farmer, and he was plowing a huge field on the day that he decided that he was done smoking. And as he was driving his tractor, he just pulled out the packet of cigarettes and threw it outside and then plowed over it. He was done. But you know what he did when he threw those cigarettes out was thinking by himself, how long am I going to last? How long before I need another cigarette. How long am I going to be victorious like this? Uh, I'm just not strong enough. I'm quite sure. And by the time that he was back at the place where he threw away the cigarettes, he stopped the tractor, got out and started looking, found the cigarettes, sat on a clump of, of, of uh, uh, soil and smoked a cigarette, but he was so disgusted with himself. So he got back into the tractor and said, that's not what should happen. So he threw it again, away again, and plowed over it again. Soon enough, it was time for him to go home and have uh, a great meal with his wife, and after he had his meal, he pushed his chair back, picked up the paper, and started feeling where he, oh, I, I forgot, I, I gave up. But man, I am so much in the mood now. I need a cigarette. I always smoke a cigarette after, after supper. And he was thinking this through. And, and, and uh, the longer he thought, the more his craving uh, expanded. And soon enough, he couldn't hold it anymore. He got out, uh, took his flashlight, and went back into the field where he kind of remembered. And Lo and behold, digging for it, he found it. Sat down on a lump of uh, soil again and quickly had three in a row. But man, he felt so disgusted. And he said to himself, I can't go on doing this. I'm done. And I'm not even going to think about this again. He even took the pack back home. What was left and put it on the mantelpiece. And he never thought about it again. And you know what happened? He gained the victory because he did not. <laughs> <laughs> he did not think about it any more. And whenever the thought came, he filled his mind with something better, 
something else. And that's the secret. We must refuse to think about evil if we want to gain the victory over it. When we want to overcome a particular sin or a particular habit, we must reckon ourselves dead to it. We must refuse to think of it and fix our mind to a new way of living. That is part of, that is our part in making the third law work. Mental discipline. When we have done our part, then and only then can God step in and do His. Why must our part come first? Because God does not ever operate by force. We must make it abundantly clear that we have set our cause to His way. And then God has the right to change our hearts by a miracle, uh, His miracle power. We must place ourselves squarely on His side through our own free choice. But as soon as we open the door to God and uh, show that by our own decision, Jesus Christ comes in and does something wonderful, spectacular, great in our lives. What does he do? He gives us a new heart. He lifts us above the law of sin by the law of the spirit of life. Were it not for God's miracle working power to change our hearts, Christianity would just be an ethic, just a good way to live. But in the third law, there is the miraculous secret of victory. Paul says that this miracle is accomplished, and I want you to hear this. This Miracle is accomplished by the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave. Do you, do you get that? Forgot to show you that one, but we talked about that quite a bit. In the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, is living, if the Spirit is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who lives in you. Think of it. The creative power of God will work in our behalf, dwelling in us so that we come to love spiritual things and want to do the will of God. Many times people are discouraged from attending the Christian life because they don't feel like doing everything a Christian should. They don't realize that if they give their hearts to God, He will put His law into their minds and hearts so that they will be motivated by spiritual things. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. When a person becomes a born-again Christian, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. 
all things are becoming new. The things that we hated before, we now love. And the things that we once loved, we hate. We are really happy serving God because He transformed us. So now we have a new spiritual life that is alive through Jesus Christ and His Spirit living in us. Ellen White, a well-known religious writer, has stated it very beautifully when she said, If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity with his will, that when obeying him, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. God's miracle power in this third law makes doing right a natural way of life for the born again Christian. Who? Oh, I forgot that I actually put the quote uh, on, on the screen for you. But here is what Paul comes and says We. Uh, all ask who will rescue us from the body of this death. And then he comes with the answer. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if the, by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. That's the answer. Paul says we need to die daily. He says our own sinful life is to be crucified with Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit that brings about this death of the old self and brings us a new birth. That is not something that is completed in a moment. Peter says it is a growing experience. We grow in grace, adding one victory to another, and our characters little by little come to more nearly resemble that of our great example. Can't we all say, thank God? We don't know about all the faults we have when we begin on this journey. We might just be too discouraged to make a start. But the, the Lord reveals to us, step by step, things over which we need to gain the victory through His grace. And as we follow His leading, we grow up in the stature of Jesus Christ. One Bible verse sums the entire process up when it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. By beholding Jesus, we become changed friend of mine tells how he took a flight with another friend in a F-1 bomber. It was quite an experience, he says. They were up in the air, not only flying solo, but they were a part of a hmm, formation. Thank you. 
Yes. Have you read my material? <laughs> You've listened to it before. <laughs> and he noticed that the pilot, following the leader in the formation, did not for one moment took his eyes off the wing of the front plane. And he kind of got scared about this. They were only following the lead of the, and eventually, even when they were coming to land, it was still pilot checking out the wing of the plane in front of him. And he says to his pilot friend, when are you ever going to look up? And the pilot replied, when our wheels touch the ground. Only then will I stop looking. Only then will I stop following. And today in this battle for the mind, I would love to encourage each one of you to follow the Lamb. Wherever He goes, wherever He leads, and whatever He asks, do it until the day that we can look up and walk the streets of the city where he is preparing a place for us. I want you, by now you know it by heart, maybe Ryan can get it on the screen for us again. Sing with me the theme song for our series. And uh, remember that Jesus is calling us to be his followers. Young ladies, come help me. And sing it uh, with everything you've got. Thank you, Jesus, that the law of sin and death does not control us when we try to keep your Ten Commandments, your uh, way of life and the description of it as we find it in the commandments, but that the spirit of life and victory is right there to make us soar like an eagle, higher and higher still, until the day that we will meet with the Savior, the Lamb of God, going before us into those places you are preparing for us. I pray that you will bless us through the rest of this day, and our lives as we live them for Jesus. 
In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Sit down for just a moment before we leave. Uh, a quick reminder that tonight we are back here and we are going to talk about a very, very important subject, the mark of the Antichrist or the mark of the beast. And I am going to share some very, very interesting material with you, even about the place of the United States in prophecy. We'd love to see you here tonight. Then tomorrow night, uh, rounding out the three nights to uh, get a copy of this book, we are going to talk about the question many people ask. Does the Bible say anything about what happens to us when we die? And uh, is there relevancy in near-death experiences? What's up? So tomorrow night, talking about uh, the mysteries of death unsolved. And then we'll have off Monday night. Yes, so you can recuperate and go wash your washing or the car or whatever you need to do. Put some plants in the ground. Yes. Uh, but Tuesday night, we'll be back and talk about the three angels with their special messages as we read about that in Revelation chapter 14. So that's what's up for the next few uh, nights, and then uh, we will be taking a day off next Thursday again and be back for the weekend after that. Uh, so tonight at 7 o'clock, same place, same time, right here, the mark of the beast. And what does that imply to us? see you tonight, but uh, also remember that we have invited you for a meal and would love to have you all eat with us this uh, afternoon. The meal is just about ready and we'll eat in the next room where uh, I bet you will have a good time. Till tonight. God bless you. Let's uh, shake hands at the door and see each other in the dining hall. Thank you.